We want to know you, Lord. Pull us closer. We want to walk with you, Lord. We want to be with you, Lord. Help us. Help us, God, to know your presence in our lives. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. May your Spirit come upon us and empower us to walk, to live, in the richness of your presence. To know your kingdom come, your will being done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, fill us. Fill us with the power to walk with you. Help us. Help us to believe. Help us to live and know that you are with us always in the power of your spirit. And it is ours, ours when we surrender to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I've entitled my sermon today, Order My Steps. And I want us to start off by reading from Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is actually the longest psalm in the entire Bible. I should have looked up how many verses there are, but it's a whole lot. We're beginning on verse 129, and there's a whole lot of verses after that, too. So uh, let's, uh, let's hear what... Uh, the Lord has to say here in Psalm 129. Your statutes are wonderful. Therefore, I obey them. The unfolding of your word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. I open my mouth and pant, longing for your commands. Turn to me and have mercy on me as you always do to those who love your name. Direct my footsteps according to your word. Let no sin rule over me. <laughs> Redeem me from the oppression of men, that I may obey your precepts. Make your face shine upon your servant, and teach me your decrees. Streams of tears flow from my eyes for your law is not obeyed. This is the word of the Lord for us, the people of God. How many people here know Jesus as Savior? How many know Him as Savior? Well, okay, let me ask you this question then. What has He saved you from? Shout it out! Seriously, what has He saved you from? Okay, from yourself, shout it out. What has he saved you from? Sin. From Myself. sin, from Satan. What else? What has he saved you from? Myself. Shout it out. Everything. Okay, everything. <laughs> okay. Um, he saves us from darkness. The unfolding of your words give light. He saves us from ignorance. He gives understanding to the simple. He saves us from condemnation. Have mercy on me as you always do to those who love your name. He saves us from injustice. Redeem me from human oppression that I may obey your precepts. All right, let me ask this question now. How many know Jesus as Lord? How many here know Jesus as Lord? Who can explain to me the difference between knowing Jesus as Savior and knowing Jesus as Lord? Anybody? Who can explain the difference there? I can be rescued by someone, but it's not the same as me then telling them that I owe them and that I am going to serve them. And then you're going to serve them. You can be rescued, you can be saved by someone but that's not the same 
as serving them and following them. Jesus is both Lord and Savior. He saves us from our sin. He saves us from our personal sin, helps us stay on track, do the right thing. You know, how He has mercy on us for when we have failed and, 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 and fallen off the path. He saves us also from the sin of society, the sin of our culture, the sin of our institutions. Direct my footsteps according to your word so that no sin rule over me. Not only our own sin, but the sin that is foisted on us sometimes, the sin that is directed to us, you know, the sin that, uh, 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 of others, of society, that sometimes uh, you know, oppresses us. Let me, get, let me get touchy here, because it's sometimes we don't talk about this always uh, in society. Our society, I don't know what it is, but uh, you know, we, don't, we have a difficult time sometimes talking about racism. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's a real thing. It's a real thing. And, um, you know, I... You look, you go back, you go back to slavery, and um, that was, yeah, that was the sin of some individuals probably that started all of that, but it became institutionalized. It became something that the society, for a large part, accepted. That society was foisting uh, sin upon the rest of society. You know, the African Americans were the ones who really suffered the, the brunt of it, but, but everybody that, that supported that system, you know, part of that institution perpetuated that. What am I trying to say? Um, you know, me, Carrie King Cannon, am I responsible for slavery? Do I, you know, am I responsible for that? No, not nope. at all. But I'll tell you one thing. I'm Facebook friends with uh, African Americans whose last name is King Cannon. So you know what that means. You know that means <coughs> I have ancestors that, that owned slaves. Um, it's not uh, it's not my sin today, but I'm a part of a society, a culture that perpetuated that sin. And uh, uh, but, but now let me not uh, let's not get so uh, seeing it as one sided. So we think that only people of European descent are sinners. We're all sinners. Every one of us is a sinner, regardless of our background, regardless of our heritage, regardless of our race. Uh, and, and not just individual sin, institutional sin, cultural sin, societal sin. It was the culture in, uh, uh, in, in how, how am I going to say it? I mean, that's, that's the wrong way to say it. The, because of the pain and the hurt in many black communities, when the opportunities for riot had to happen, could happen, riots happened. You think of Los Angeles, you think of Baltimore, you think of Ferguson. And, 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 and the riots that broke out. Now, we can explain the oppression. We can explain uh, uh, the reaction, what they're reacting to that was, was evil, was wrong. But still, two wrongs don't make a right. And there is a sin 
that comes up that we somehow all, t it takes us over. And so we end up doing things that are negative, uh, supporting things that are negative. When we know Jesus as Lord, when we know him more than just as Savior, when we know him as Lord, we follow him. When we know him as Lord, we seek out his ways. We seek out, we seek to understand what it is that he was teaching. How is he trying to help us to live? What is he trying to, to help us understand about this life that we are in and, and how we walk through this life? And, 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 and what difference does it make? What difference does it make if we follow him or if we uh, uh, follow him? somebody else. Let me, let me ask you this question. What are the benefits of following Jesus as Lord? What are those benefits? Well, you know, why don't we follow Donald Trump as Lord or Barack Obama as Lord? You know? Um, uh, the ancient Romans followed their leader as Lord. The ancient Romans followed Caesar as Lord. That's who they were trying to serve. That's who they were following. That's who they wanted to know what, uh, uh, how that person wanted them to live. No, we don't follow. We don't follow anybody as Lord today if we're, if we're a Christian other than Jesus Christ. Now, can you honestly say you are trying to follow Jesus as Lord? Or is there something else in our society, in our culture, that has captured you? That you kind of really search after that and, and seek after that instead of seeking to know Jesus? Are you seeking something as needed as, as your own security? Are you seeking wealth? You know, what is it that, that you are seeking? Are you seeking to follow Jesus as Lord? trying to get to know him better, trying to follow him in a deeper, more committed way. Because you know that in following him, that's where your salvation is wrapped up. In following him, that's where your peace comes. Yes, Jesus gives his salvation freely to everyone who asks. To everyone who says, Lord, come to me. I give my life to you. His salvation will come to you. But what good is it? And do we really hold on to it if we don't at least try to continue to follow him as Lord? If we're not trying, if we could care less about what God is asking us to do, about how to live, do you really have his salvation? If you're not trying, yeah, we're all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. But do we... I don't mean just admit up here, but I mean admit here that I need God to help me walk the straight and narrow, to do the kind of life, to live the kind of life that he's calling us to live. Do, you know, uh, 
And we know, we know if we seek God, honestly seek Him, His Spirit will empower us to walk the walk that He's calling us to. To take those steps. It's not always easy. There are many obstacles in this life. But He can empower us. Let me ask you this. You know, if we're talking about what the benefits of following Jesus as Lord look like. Um, let me ask you this question. What would a perfect world look like to you? Or what would a world that was trying to live out exactly what God wants for creation, what would that perfect world look like to you? Anybody? Probably be scary. Why would that be? Uh, you never know the unexpected. Okay. All right. What would a perfect world look like to anybody else? If things were working exactly the way God wanted them to work, what would it look like? Mark? No police. <laughs> we, we wouldn't have to, yeah. We, we wouldn't need police, would we? There's an old song by Woody Guthrie I love, and he talks about... Uh, uh, the hobo going to heaven, and one of the things he loves about heaven is there's no police force in heaven. So, because <laughs> you don't need it. Yeah, what, what would a perfect world be? I think worldwide we have democracy, because I think it's the best government that we have right now. Everybody has a choice. It's more Christian than most nations. And I say for us all to be Christian, to exalt God, to live in harmony as much as we can. We, we'd be living in harmony. Let me just throw this other thought out there, though, that, that democracy is the rule of the people. It's not necessarily the rule of God. So, and, and, you know, but if everybody was following God, then we would be living in a, in a more perfect world. Right. No board. So, yes, okay. Um, anybody else? What, what a perfect world. Are you, is your hand up there, Anna? Universal health care. Universal health care. Absolutely. No we need. would have health care. There would be nobody that, need that needed health care that yeah. wouldn't receive it yeah. in this world. What? No, <clears throat> no physical or emotional hunger. No physical or emotional hunger. Can you imagine... It, it, you know, just if, if, if everybody in the world was fed and there was enough to get food for everybody. Can you imagine what it would be like if uh, then if, uh, 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 you know, what we were searching for, uh, emotionally longing for, if we had it, if it was here, if it was ours. Anybody else? What would, yeah. You know. <clears throat> Paradise. No, no famine, no wars, you know. Yeah, Judy? Everybody would be a minister. Everybody <laughs> would be a minister. That's right. Everybody. Because, because that's really what it means to be a Christian is to be in ministry. Everybody is here living out God's purpose. Um, let me share this with you. Jesus came proclaiming that this is the time. The time has come. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. Jesus is claiming the time has come. This is the time. The kingdom of God is is at hand. All of this that you've been laying out there, all of this that you've been saying what a perfect world could look like, Jesus is saying, this is the time. What are you waiting for? Why are you dilly-dallying? 
the kingdom of God, another world is possible. This world that we know in our fallenness, in our brokenness, this is not God's world. God created it, but we've fallen. God's world is possible. This other way of life is possible. But what do we have to do? What do we have to do to have this way of life? We have to repent and believe the good news. To repent means to reorient our values. To re in this case, to repent means start living those values of God's kingdom here and now. Don't wait. Don't wait for something else to happen. You know, start living God's values right now. Start living it in your own life. Start living it in your family's life. Start living it in your church's life. And as much as you can, start living it in your community's life. You know, it's, you know... No, after the up. I think that, that the, the world... The world's in need of God. The world is in real need of the presence of God. <clears throat> and it starts with us. We who are the followers of Jesus Christ. It starts with those who know Jesus as Lord. So, how do we know the presence of the kingdom and the benefits of the, the, the kingdom? It starts by cleaning our own act up, first of all. Are we trying to do the best we can? Are we asking for God's guidance? Are we asking for God's direction in our life? Lord, what do you want me to do? And Lord, order my steps. Help me make this possible. Help me take those steps that I need to take in my life to make it happen. And then, are you demonstrating to your family? Are you living that out in your family? So that, that the, the love that empowers you, the love of God in Jesus Christ, because that's what empowers us. We follow Jesus because he revealed God's love to us, God's mercy, God's grace. Are we, are we walking with him in a way that those values are being imparted to our family? Or is our family, our family's going to see our fallen side. There's just no ands, ifs, or buts about it. They know us better than anybody else, and they see our brokenness, and we're all broken. What are you talking about your brokenness? Are you allowing them to see that you're trying to overcome your brokenness? Are you allowing them to see that you are, 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 are trying to walk in the light of the Lord? And, and, and when you uh, stumble and fall, do you ask for their forgiveness? Because you, you know, you shouted out, ranted and raved, or, you know, uh, did something that hurt someone else in your family. Did you make an apology for and ask for their forgiveness, and are you trying to make the right amends? And then what are we doing in our churches? We need to be doing that same thing that we do in our families, certainly. But if we believe another world is possible, if we believe the kingdom of God is at hand, what are we doing in our churches that shows the kingdom of God. What are we doing in our churches that manifests the kingdom of God? We talk about no more famine, no more homelessness, no more emotional pain. You know, what are we doing in our churches 
that manifest the kingdom. We're not perfect here at Rising Hope by any means. But at least we have come together as a congregation and those who support us trying to feed the hungry, trying to alleviate that hunger, trying to, you know, offer at least shelter to during the cold months to those who need it. Now, a whole lot more is needed. A whole lot more is needed than that. We need to not only alleviate hunger, try to feed the hungry, we need to try to figure out why there are so many hungry people. Why are there people without jobs that, 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 that can't afford, where they can't afford to meet all their needs? We need to be asking those questions. And we need to be trying to resolve those questions at a societal level. You know, it's one thing to, to house people who are homeless during the cold months, but we also need to be asking, why is there homelessness? What do we need to do in our society that can help address that? How do we as a society create enough jobs that will give people a decent living so they don't have to be homeless? Or how do we need to make sure we create the kind of health care system and mental health care system that you know, cares for those who can't care for themselves? No. These are the ways that we as a congregation can begin to give witness to the fact that this is the time. This is the moment that we are to act, that the kingdom of God is at hand, another world is possible, and we are going to be doing our little piece to try to make that new world Possible. I think one of the worst things that happened to Christianity is when Constantine made it the state religion. Because it established it as a religion. And then people just began to think, well, this is something, all I got to do is assent to it. All I have to do is believe it, and, and I'll be okay. Before then, it was a movement. Before then, and Constantine did this in the 300s, folks, a little bit of church history. Okay, in the 300s, before, for the first 200 and some odd years of the church's life, it wasn't considered a, an official religion. It was a movement. It was a people that were dedicated to bringing God's kingdom on earth his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It was people that were committed to living this out, this goal, this promise that Jesus said. This is the time to act. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. They were trying to make that a reality. And if you read the church historians, I'm sure Garth and others are real big uh, uh, into that. I know Anna and Annalise and others have read these uh, 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 church historians too. But, um, you know, they, they, they talk about one of the reasons Christianity spread so much in, in, in the first centuries is because of the way they embraced everybody the way they welcomed everybody, the way they reached out with help. You know, they were doing more than, than, than the, the official establishments were doing to help others. And that's why people began to see, well, maybe this is the way we should live. Loving and caring and helping one another. I don't know that we see Christianity as a movement anymore. As a movement that has a goal. A goal that we are going after. Our goal 
is to manifest the kingdom of God. We are to work with Jesus. Jesus, when, when he left us, he wanted us to continue his ministry. He appointed Peter to head up the church. You know, uh, when he left us, he said, preach the gospel to all nations. And, and, and what is that good news? That's what gospel means. It's that this kingdom is at hand. Repent and believe. This way of life is what is going to allow God's presence to manifest itself. And his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It was a movement. Something that people were reaching for. Are we reaching for that in the church anymore? That's what we need to be reaching for. The kingdom of God is at hand. Do you believe him? Do you believe Jesus? When he said, the kingdom of God is at hand, or is he just... Is that's one thing you say, oh no, Jesus was wrong. No. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and God's righteousness. And then all this that you're looking for will be added unto you. Matthew 6. Seek first the kingdom of God. And then this new life will be yours. It will be yours because you're seeking it at your own personal level. The power of the Holy Spirit coming upon you to help you make the changes that you need to make in your life and, 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 and seek it at a societal level, a family level, an institutional level. Seek it at every level. And then His kingdom is at hand. This is the time. Repent and believe. When we start repenting and believing, when we start seeking God's kingdom in our lives, and in the world, seeking God's salvation. You know, your salvation is not something you just do, Lord, I accept you, and then you put it up on a shelf. It's not something like that. We've got to keep living into it. We have to keep seeking Him as Lord, following Him as Lord. And when we really do that, the first thing that happens is God begins to order our steps. God begins to direct what it is and how we should be living. Um, and then as he orders our steps, we find that our lives clean up. We find that our focus is different. Our focus is no longer on what I want, but we begin to want what God wants. And when we begin to want what God wants, that's when we know His Spirit is really getting into us. His Spirit is really reaching in. We're trying here at Rising Hope to begin to refocus refocus on what it is that God wants for us. You know, we do a lot of wonderful things. Feed the hungry, clothe the naked, welcome the stranger, shelter the homeless. We do a lot of wonderful things. But we're not a social service agency. That's not our goal. 
feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, sheltering the homeless. That's, those are just means of getting to our goal. Those are just ways that we show everybody that comes in here, God loves the total being. God loves the whole person. God isn't concerned just about your soul. He is most certainly concerned about your soul. But he's also concerned about your welfare. Have you got enough to, for your family? You know, are, are they safe and secure? Are you growing and your family growing in a, in a good environment? God cares about the total being. So we here at Rising Hope try to show God's love through the food pantry, the clothing closet, the hypothermia shelter, and everywhere. But the goal is the kingdom. The goal is the kingdom of God. The goal is that, that people who are fed and clothed and sheltered will begin to see that God's got so much more possibility, so much more waiting for us, that, 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 that God wants us to join in this movement to bring His kingdom. And then in His kingdom, everybody's cared. Psalm 37 says, The Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. Though he may stumble, he will not fall, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. We are, are, are trying to order our steps here at Rising Hope so that people know the kingdom. So that when, when, when someone comes in here, they'll know that we're more than just a handout. They'll know that we're about building something in the community. That what we're about building is, is, is the presence of God's kingdom. And that we're all included. God wants us all to be a part of this that um, that we all have a role in, in, in helping Jesus continue his ministry of proclaiming and manifesting the kingdom of God. So we have decided, uh, the staff came up with this, and I run it by the church leadership, um, we're going to try to develop, a, a, I don't know what we're going to call it, but sort of like refocusing sessions so that everybody understands, volunteers, uh, members, staff, all understand that our focus is on manifesting the kingdom in all that we do. You know, it's not just about, as I said, the food. It's, it, 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 it's not a success if all you're doing is giving out food to someone. That's a good thing. But we measure success in whether Jesus Christ was revealed. You know, was the presence of the kingdom revealed? You know, and again, I don't mean witnessing, you know, uh, in a, in a way where you, you have to say, you know, um, you know, here's your food, you can only eat it if you believe in Jesus Christ. It's not that kind of thing. <laughs> but we do want people to know that it is the love of God in Jesus Christ that provides this food. And that's why we do what we do. We're not a social service agency. We're here about manifesting the kingdom. So we're going to develop these refocusing sessions, and we're going to want everybody to help us. Help us with these refocusing sessions, take these refocusing sessions, help uh, uh, teach some of these refocusing sessions. 
And, and, and one of the things we do, you know, in, in, in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul says, you know, uh, that, that God wants everything done in a decent and orderly way. So one of the things we're doing at noon, worship, you know, we have worship here every day, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday at noon. We're going to make sure that everybody knows that that's what we're doing. And so the church, the, the, social, the social service side of what we do is going to close down. And everybody that's in the building is going to come up for worship. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. For that half hour that we are here. We're going to lock the door and there's going to be a person at the door greeting them. Uh, saying, oh, you know, you're welcome to come in. The services are shut down right now, but come on in to worship. And then they can decide whether they want to come up to worship or stay outside. Because we want people to know this is everything we do comes out of worship. And then we're talking about, then we need to, we need to talk about in the church council, and one of the things we'll talk about in the council meeting today, so I hope you show up, is should we do something similar on Sundays? Should we, you know, work with the ushers to have one person designated to be at the door and lock the door so that the people that come in are only coming up to worship? You know, sometimes we've had people just hanging around in the foyer, not coming in to worship, and sometimes that gets a little ruckusy, and we, if that's a word, um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> We want, we want people to understand where our focus is. Why we're here. The early church, the early church was incredibly focused. You know, they, they met together regularly in one another's homes. They shared meals with one another. They worshipped regularly in the temple together, you know, they, they, they uh, devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. They were really concerned about how do we help this movement of moving on to getting the kingdom of God, manifesting it, that they really devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. And one of the things they did to, to manifest that was they made sure there wasn't a needy person among them. You know, they expected everybody to be fully committed to what the church was doing. That this is what it means if we're going to be going towards this goal. And as a result, they performed many signs, wonders, and miracles because they were all focused on the same thing. Jesus is Savior. Jesus is Lord. Another world is possible when we follow Him as Lord. It starts with us. The time is now. Repent. <laughs>